welcome, Tad, to World Fantasy Convention Thank 2019. You, um, we're here to ask you a few questions about Empire of Christ. So, to start off, if you could talk a little bit about your um, writing this story and which characters were the hardest to get into for this particular volume. I think the hardest thing about this, since this is a continuation of a series I wrote 30 years ago or more, which is astonishing, because clearly looking at me, I must have been, what, nine when I wrote that? But um, no, I think the most difficult thing was none of the new characters, because I've been doing that my whole career, is making new characters. What was difficult was going back to the most familiar of the old characters and trying to age them into adulthood or sometimes even into late adulthood in a way that I hoped would be believable to the people who, you know, read and cared about the originals. And especially, obviously, in the case of the two main protagonists uh, from the old book, Simon and Miriam Hill, um, both of whom their lives changed quite a bit, especially Simon's, without giving anything away, from what kind of a person and position he was in in the first book. So the hardest part was to do justice to those characters, but also, and here's the complicated part, the reader's feelings about those characters and then try and bring an adult version without the reader having been able to see the change, the evolution of the characters, and present them now full-blown to the audience, including a new audience, and trying to make them consistent, and to the extent that the, the readers were emotionally involved with them, have them still be emotionally involving, despite the fact that they're in a quite different position and time in life. Still liking them, even though they were old. Yes, exactly. Yeah, That's like very us. well put. Yes, because let's face it, old people are horrible. Right, except for us. Well, yeah, one of us anyway. So, was there a character who emerged from this process and kind of surprised you with either how well they've held up over the years or they turned out to be one of your favorite characters in this new phase of their life where it was, you know, they moved on and they become something that was kind of surprising to you? Oh, absolutely. Um, there's a there's both examples. To give you an example of uh, new characters, um, it's really funny because we present Simon and Mary Mel's grandson, Morgan, in this book, and I remember how pissed off all the readers used to get at Mary Mel and especially Simon back during the first books because they were adolescents and they did adolescent things and particularly Simon was, you know, he's, he was called the moon calf, Simon the moon calf, and he did gormless things and got in trouble and all that. And the readers would write to me and say, oh, Simon irritates me somebody, I just want to smack him in the head and these kinds of things. And the response to the first book, The Witchwood Crown, where Morgan is introduced, and he is a bit of a ne'er-do-well in those books. He's a bit of a Prince Hal. Um, and uh, I got the same kinds of responses from the reader. I sure hope this kid grows up a bit, because boy, I'd like to take him over my knee. And, you know. So that's always fun. Um, but then there's also characters that come out of nowhere, as Kadrak did in the first books. And one of them, for me anyway, is there's a character in the second book called Turia. Um, who is Lady Turia in Gadaris, or later Lady Turia in uh, Benedrivis, who is a very young woman who is a Nebanai noble. And she was just essentially a plot device when I first thought of her. It was a way to get characters down to the band for a big uh, wedding and all that. And then she turned into quite a character in and of herself, and so much so that I said, you know, I may have to write another big, monstrous, bloated, swollen trilogy to give her a chance to come into her own as a character, because she's not going to go through a few complete character arc in these books. There's just no way I could squeeze her in as a major character, although she does a lot of stuff in the, in the second book, in the, the Emperor, Empire of Grass. So that's an example of two new characters. All the norms in this one were really fun to write because, of course, I never went beyond the facade of the norms, you know, the, the sort of evil elf-like creatures. Um, and again, evil is in quotes because this time you get to see them, you get to be in there with them, have a point of view, and uh, so that was really interesting and entertaining to, to be able to, after making them an object of pure loathing in the first set of books, to now in the second set be able to say, and here's how they think of themselves. Because, of course, nobody thinks of themselves as villains. And in even societies that do wrong, 
are very complex into how they get into that position where the rest of us think, oh, they're a rogue state, which is sort of what the norms are. So that is all the new stuff that's really exciting. And then, of course, the old characters, especially the, the, the most important ones. I mentioned Simon and Miriamel, Ailair, Binabic and his wife Siski, all these characters from the first book. They were more than just characters. To me, I spent seven years writing those books. They became people. And so it's been, once I got over the initial worry of trying to make sure that they still felt like those people, um, it was a great joy to be able to revisit them, because I never thought I would, and be able to say, well, what's happened in their lives? Who have they become? Not just what has happened to them, but who has, what, has those, what have those events made them into? And we get to see their adult selves. Um, so that whole process has been probably the most fun part of the book, and it was the part I dreaded the most. That's amazing. That's, I think, one of the best things about the series, not just revisiting the old characters and seeing who they've become and getting to know them again, but also what you mentioned about the, the Norns and how you're kind of flipping the script a little bit and showing from their well, angle they, who they are, because you're right, everybody is their own hero, right? So yeah. it's really interesting to see their side of the story. I'm very glad to hear that. Thank you. I mean, yeah, because... That was the other thing. When you're, when you're going back to something that's maybe your best known piece of work, the last thing you want to do is to try to write the same book over again. Because first of all, you can't do it. It'll never be the same book because the early one exists and you're a different writer and a different person and the readers have changed and there are new readers. But also then the, the, the challenge becomes to find a way to, to walk that, that, that tightrope where on the one hand you're giving people what they want, because in a sense it's a kind of a brand name. You know, it's like saying Rocky Road ice cream. Well, you don't stick raisins in Rocky Road ice cream, or you don't put, you know, pistachio in Rocky Road this ice cream. This is the best cream. analogy I've ever heard. Oh, Please you, continue. Um, so, you know, you want to give people that, but on the other hand, you don't want them to go, eh, you know, now that I try it again, I realize I'm kind of bored with Rocky Road. You want to give them something about it that feels new and different, so you make it more chocolatey or more, you know, the marshmallows are different kinds of marshmallow or whatever it is you're doing. Obviously, I'm an ice cream person. <laughs> I love this. Keep, keep <laughs> but well, no, but I mean, so that's the that's the basic thing is that you have this responsibility you don't have with a new book and new characters that you have to give people that feeling that they remember from the first book. Obviously, you cannot. You cannot replicate that experience for anybody, not yourself, not the readers, while also changing it up so much that people go, oh, it was worthwhile reading these new books. I, I felt re-engaged in the world. I learned more about it. I, you know, I appreciate what happened in the first books and maybe even want to go back and reread them and all those kinds of things. So that's really been the challenge. But that's also why it, it has surprised me by how much I've enjoyed it. I was really not certain that I would be able to do it. I had moments of panic, especially with the idea, as I've mentioned to other people before, that I might screw up the experience so badly that people would now hate me for ruining the original. The ones who knew the books would like go, oh, I can't even read those anymore. You know, it's like when somebody you really like comes out and says something political that horrifies you, and you're suddenly going, oh my god, I can't ever look at that person's work again without thinking, oh no, they said that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I don't think any of us know what you're talking about. None no, of us no, can of course not, because, you know, it's such a non-political <laughs> world we right. live in these days. Well, I think you've done very well, obviously, and we Thank have you. faith that you're going to continue to do it really well when Certainly you do this new giant three-bit trilogy that you just alluded to. You've heard of it, right? Um, yeah, that I, we'll I, be spinning off to. I, I, so I put we'll it on record. I'll put it on record. So with all these other stresses and worries and, you know, thoughts that you've been having, angsty kind of teenage thoughts, actually, <laughs> uh, maybe Morgan-like, actually, about revisiting this world um, recently, not too recently, but fairly recently, you have had a shoulder injury while you were trying to write the next volume. So how did you feel about that? And well, well, how did you overcome it? Because obviously you're doing pretty well. Thank now. you. Um, well, obviously, I, I, I wish it was a really cool story where I'd like flipped my Lamborghini, you know, on Dead Man's Curve or something, or been attacked by a bear or anything. Right? Storyteller. Run with it. I, well, I know. It's just the, the truth is what it is. It's just you know one of those things where you know your body starts to fall apart at a certain point in life. And um, no, I, I had a 
couple had a torn labrum and a torn rotator cuff, and that in itself is not uh, suspense, uh, suspenseful or interesting in any way. Uh, the only thing that was interesting to me is that I learned some lessons about myself because it turned into about 10 months in which I couldn't work. And the reason was uh, the pain, not the disability, not the inability to type because I could have found other ways to do it. But the, the pain and the long time in which it lasted because it took a long time to diagnose it and then I had to wait a long time for surgery and then I had to do the recovery. Well, what that did to me is it actually shut down the part of me where I do my creating. And it was a bit horrifying. I have never in my life ever not been able to go to that part of me. It's not only my job, it's my refuge. It's my place where I am most me in a lot of ways is making things. It's why I will probably never retire because I'm going to be making things no matter what in my head. And I'll continue to do that, I hope, until I pitch over dead. We hope in the future. Um, at least, you know. Uh, far, far in the future, if ever. Uh, if ever. You know, if ever. Just leave it open. Okay, we'll leave it open. Uh, but so, um, and my wife has told this story many times, how at one point during the, the, you know, most of a year process of not being able to work, um, I came storming out of the back room, screaming that, that you know, like, I am, I am not a consumer. I, I have to create things, you know? And it was really true. It was like a fundamental part of myself was missing, and I went, is this what it feels like to, to other people who, who just take in other people's art but don't yeah. send any back, you know? And I'm not saying that in a diminishing way. I'm just saying if you're somebody who has always made things, and I always have. Before I was a writer, I was an artist, and I was, you know, played music and did theater. So I've always had that going on in my life since I was kind of old enough to remember. So that feeling was not just shocking, it was it was really disheartening because it reminds you that you're in this flesh envelope and it has a massive effect on your ability to do the things you want to do with your brain. And that, you know, there's a part of, a, a, of, of the creative mind where you're kind of thinking, yeah, even when I'm like in a wheelchair and I'm 112 and, you know, I'm drooling and blah, 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 my mind will still be active. And then one bad shoulder injury and it shuts off and you go, oh my God, you know, it's not quite as certain as I thought it was. So it's a glimpse of not just physical mortality, um, which, you know, once you get past 40, you get those every day, but it, it was a glimpse of loss of control of the, the things that are most important to me. So that was terrifying. That said, it has definitely, um, once, it, once I was able to get back to work, which was about April, um, I dove in with a, you know, just an absolute um, desperation, but also exhilaration as well, because I was back to being me again, you know, and it was really like that. It was, you know, like, I can't even think of it. It was almost like coming out of a coma or something. You know, it's like I have my mind. I'm in the world. I can get to the things that that I need to be complete. So, um, you know, it was no experience like that is fun. I'm still I'm going to be paying for the loss of a year's writing time for a long time in one shape or form. But I learned some things about myself. And if nothing else, any experience, no matter how wretched, and mine was not that bad compared to what a lot of people go through in their lives. But any bad experience, you can at least learn things and, and maybe find a better way to move forward and a better way to appreciate the world and what you have. Wow. Yeah, that's an amazing journey, amazing story. Well, we're very glad that you came through and came out of it and uh, regained your creative mind. I am too, especially for my family's sake, because, mm -hmm. you know, poor Deborah, if I had not come out of that and if I just had to lie there for the rest of my life watching Netflix and gritting my teeth, mm -hmm. I don't think I would have been a very fun mm -hmm. spouse. And just like the rest of us, okay? <laughs> well, that's exciting. Um, and that's uh, Navigator's Children that you are I am, I doing written, this renewed flurry I've of activity. I've written about 900 pages since April. So awesome. I've been just, you know, pedal to the metal, straight ahead. I think I've probably got another 300 or so to go. And then I start the rewrite process. And I will drag all my friends and, and co-defendants in. And uh, they will help me whip the book into final shape. 300 pages, really? I think that's about it, yeah. But then again, you know, I, I've been known to, you know, underestimate these things in the past. Yeah. <laughs> well, you may not realize that. Well, if we're still within standard binding that's protocols, actually what I'm then you probably with. need to push it a lot. I, I, just... I literally am worrying about that because I don't want it to be so long that it can't come out as a single volume. But on the other hand, I am never you going to, I am never going to write a book and put it out that I am not 
that's not the best I can do, right. you know, so I'm never going, so there may come a point where I'll go, oh, this is actually going to be more like 1,400 pages, and that's too long for binding technology, but we'll see. Well, but, okay, we'll work with that. I but I'm definitely, right. I'm definitely on the downward slope. I'm getting to that point that when you're um, planning a book, in some cases I started some of these ideas I had back in 2014 when I started the project, I'm getting to that point where I'm finally getting to those scenes that were that I imagined in my head. And of course, they're much different when you actually get there because the practicalities of getting to that point have changed various things. So some of them are happening with different people, some of them are happening in different places, some of them are happening earlier or later than I expected to, but at least I'm finally, because you know more about the ending than you do about the middle when you start mm -hmm. a book, or at least when I do. So I'm, I'm checking off now some of those things that I've been going, God, it'll be so much fun when I get to this part, and ooh, when I get to this part, that'll be really exciting. I'll have to research X, Y, and Z. So I'm getting to that point now where the, all the, the, the bits are starting to fall into place for the ending, and it's uh, both exhilarating and, as always, it's like, can I pull this off? You know? and, and if I didn't worry about that, that would be a problem. You know, if, I, I think any time you create any kind of work of art or any kind of thing that you're your personhood is really, and you know, imagination and creativity is really poured into. It doesn't have to just be art. But anytime you do something like that, if you're not afraid that you're going to mess it up, and if you're not wondering, can I do this? Can I pull this off? You're probably not taking the risks you need to take. You're not stretching yourself. And that is one of the great things about our field and being a writer is that you never stop learning, you keep stretching, and you keep trying to get better. That's awesome. Very cool. Well, I can't re wait to read it. I'm very excited to see if we can see the result of this burst of creativity that you have. And Thank you. To get back to writing. And, Thank you. Uh, I, I, I am too, but there's always, there's always a part of me that goes, people are going to read this and go, shit, was he still on like <laughs> OxyContin or something? When I don't think that's a downside. <laughs> I think that's a selling point. <laughs> you gotta bring the new generation. See if you can figure out where Tad was blasted out of his mind on industrial pharmaceuticals. Yeah, okay. could be. I, I'm hoping to get a lot of that, get rid of that in the rewrite. So. Oh man. Okay. Well, as long as we get to read it first, I'm okay with that. Okay. Sounds great. Well, thank you. Thank you, Angela. Appreciate it. Always nice to talk to you. You too.